we get started it's already 4 10 almost okay yeah so should i get started okay uh, now let me <laughs> introduce you i have the pleasure of introducing you today so good afternoon everyone welcome to the second talk of by public outreach and education committee of the astronomical society of india in association with the working group on gender equity i am arunima banerji from izat tirupati chair working group for gender equity of the astronomical society of india so we have been holding this series of talks focusing on women in astronomy the goal of this series is to showcase women astronomers and space scientists and their contributions to science and society in the context of astronomical science the overarching idea is to inspire the younger generation and the and the public alike the first talk of the series was given by professor s sita raman research institute bangalore in february 2023 so we welcome you to the second talk of the series today and by professor shivrani tirupati from indian institute of astrophysics bangalore dr shivrani tirupati obtained her phd uh, from iia bangalore if i am not wrong yeah it is from iia yeah. bangalore from there uh, she took up post doctoral fellowships at the university de montpellier uh, and at the observatory de trieste italy uh, where she was part of the vlt large program on first stars after taking a short break uh, she resumed her research with a visiting associate position at ayuka pune later she joined michigan university as a joint institute for nuclear physics uh, joint as a joint institute for nuclear astrophysics post doc uh, during 2004 and 2008 between 2004 2008 she was at the university of florida as sds's marvel post doc for a year before she joined the indian institute of astrophysics as a reader in 2009 her research interests include galactic archaeology instrumentation and exoplanet studies so welcome shivrani uh, we are very yeah. glad to have you today as the second speaker of this series and over to you yeah thank you arunima i it's a real honor and a real pleasure for me and uh, i'm glad to see so many of my colleagues and friends this is really a, indeed an honor for me so i think because we are already a little bit delayed i will quickly go into the topic so the title i kind of um, uh, decided based on the how my career path went along like i started working on this um stars oh, like initially ma'am ne bola yeah so i started working on mostly on stellar spectroscopy then moved on to instrumentation then some bit of exoplanets so i thought uh, how the path to cover and then how i could contribute in some way like uh, so so i thought it's i will in the end i would just uh, close by saying like how i could some difficulties which i had in kind of uh, balancing all these different um, areas of research so the yeah, next slide please uh, arunima yeah. yeah so i'll focus first on the uh, stellar archaeology and uh, so which i would start with uh, the it, the area like uh, like when would the first stars form in the universe like this is a area of still open research we still don't really understand the epoch um, there are a lot of uh, constraints with the new observations which jwst 21 cm lines there is a lot of research going on so it's still it's an open area like when the first stars formed in the universe so uh, so this is just a, this is a very um, everybody knows this uh, plot like uh, so uh, we could see this after the universe um, started expanding and cooled and then the first hydrogen atoms formed that's when the first atoms formed in the universe and further universe cooled to make these gravitationally bound first stars in the galaxy uh, next slide please yeah so this is just an illustration to see like uh, the jwst image you can see so plenty of these small tiny uh, galaxies and uh, so according to the theory of galaxy formation we know this uh, small uh, galaxies merge to form big galaxies like milky way so if there were first stars formed in the tiny dwarf galaxies uh, which is still re are not reachable by big telescopes uh, but we can 
probe the signature of these first early stars and if they have exploded as supernovae. So their signature or the chemical imprints could be seen in the first stars uh, or the, the early stars that formed in the galaxy, in, the, in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So, so as, as per the hierarchical uh, merging of uh, galaxy formation, these small dwarfs could have contributed to form uh, in forming the Milky Way. So yeah, can you go to the next yeah. slide, please? Yeah. So this is the... Um, kind of illustration to show like after Big Bang, we only had very few elements that is the hydrogen, primar primarily hydrogen, 75% and 25% helium and a trace amount of lithium was present in the galaxy, in the universe. And then further, we have the first time the elements were produced uh, beyond anything beyond these the three elements were produced in the first stars when they exploded as during, during the nucleosynthesis in the core and when they explode as supernovae, they made a lot of uh, metals. This is the first time. So as the several generations of stars um, uh, come along, we see this, this is the plot as time progresses, you can see the metallicity increasing in the galaxy. Yeah. So this is again a life cycle of the how the en enrichment happens in the universe, like uh, from the molecular cloud then stars form and they towards their end state end stages of the star they explode and uh, they produce a lot of uh, higher heavier elements like beyond helium and these elements further enrich the interstellar cloud and then next generation of stars form with more and more enriched in these uh, heavy elements yeah so, yeah so this is just again just to give some introduction like uh, so this is the a sun-like star would uh, evolve from its main sequence. Sure. No. no. The um, no. going to the what is called the asymptotic giant branch phase, where it and then finally it expands as a, a beautiful uh, planetary nebulae, and they enrich the interstellar medium with the uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and some neutron capture elements, which I would discuss in the later slides. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is a, an, again an illustration of the in, um, interior structure. So you can see that the core of a uh, asymptotic giant branch star, when during the final stages, would have would be having a carbon oxygen core, and further outer shells will be having hydrogen and helium burning alternatively going on in the shell, which would really um, kind of enhances the mass loss and. Uh, all the enriched nucleosynthesis material, synthesized material will be thrown to the interstellar medium. Primarily, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen um, would be made by these stars. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so if uh, like a star like our um, sun, when they reach um, asymptotic giant branch phase, and then it will become a, after a planetary nebulae, the central core become, become a super, uh, a wide bar. Like if this particular star, in if it is in a binary system, we could also have type 1a supernovae, where uh, the if uh, wide dwarf has a companion star, which is a red giant, when it accretes the material, so the uh, wide dwarf would reach uh, masses which are more than the um, uh, standard shaken mass limit and explodes as a supernovae. And this is one of the primary sources of uh, iron peak elements in the universe. The type 1a supernovae are the, one of the key uh, source of making these heavy elements. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is a, just a show that if it is a star is a more massive, like 10 solar masses of uh, star, that, that could produce many more elements, like uh, they burn um, like up to the iron in the core, silicon burning, up to silicon burning happens in the, in the star. So you would have this onion shell. So what you can see is the central region where the actual nucleosynthesis happens. And that is very small, tiny fraction of the um, star. And uh, the spectrum in the right-hand side shows the, the ejecta from a supernovae and what are the uh, various elements which are um, emitted by, uh, you can see in this uh, supernovae. And also the, on the right-hand side, the bottom plot shows the, the light curve. So we can, what we can clearly see is that the, the light 
um, during a supernovae ejecta. It's powered by the radioactive cobalt and nickel. Uh, so that is, can be clearly seen by the exponential decay of these. So primarily, uh, so uh, AGP stars, type 1A supernovae and type 2 supernovae are one of these um, uh, main sources that enrich our galaxy with the chemical elements. So this is, uh, yeah, just I wanted to show like these slides, uh, different slides is what you can see is the pattern of it, the, depending on the mass of the uh, stars, you can see the, um, the different ratios of these elements are made in different quantities. So that is one of the key signature we use like uh, in identifying the history of the uh, ejecta, like basically when you have a, um, low mass star that inherited material from an ejecta of this mixture of various uh, supernovae and AGB star and type 1A, type 2 supernovae. So they have a very clear signatures of these elements, so which can be seen in the so 11 solar masses, 15 solar masses, and 20, 25, and 35 are shown in this graph. And you can see that the ratios are very typical of their masses. So this key um, property is being used in the galactic archaeology. So if you have the ratios of element is one of the key um, imprint which we are looking at in probing the, the progenitors of these uh, low mass stars that formed from these ejecta. So yeah, so this is, you can see that, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, maybe next slide we can go to them. Yeah, so this can be seen by I just wanted to illustrate that pattern is very significantly different for different supernovae. Yeah. yeah, okay, this is again, if these um, supernovae are, uh, these uh, the remnants are uh, neutron star, um, binary neutron stars, then they would be all know about this uh, gravitational wave, um, recent um, gravitational wave detection by a binary neutron stars. And these, those are uh, the uh, one of the currently. This is the one uh, one of the sources we know that they would make a very highly neutron rich uh, nuclei um, in the in the universe. So currently, yeah. So this is one of the problems which is not uh, known. Like uh, we know all the way till um, iron peak elements, the supernovae could make. But elements beyond iron, you cannot be made through fusion. They have to be made through neutron capture. And uh, to produce elements all the way till uranium and thorium, the highly neutron-rich elements, we still don't know the astrophysical sites. And um, clear the event, which uh, gravitational wave uh, event uh, of binary neutron star merger event, has produced a rich ejecta of um, rare lanthanides um, from the in ejecta, they were able to detect uh, strontium directly from the ejecta. That's a kind of a, a smoking gun event where we could clearly see the ejecta is rich with uh, lanthanides and actinides. So this was a, one of the uh, yeah clear events, but uh, we there are some problems with uh, this being one of only source for neutron rich uh, nuclear production, which I would go into the later slides. Yeah. Good move to the next slide. Yeah. Maybe you can quickly pass it. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's so basically what is in this, um, uh, uh, what is happening is as the tidal disruption from a new, the neutron stars, we all know that it is full of neutrons, free neutrons. And as the tidal disruption happens, the neutron-rich nuclei start to make, uh, for the, so the de degeneracy is lifted and the neutron would become a proton. And then further and further along the, um, the neutron drip line, you would start making the elements. So all the way, we these conditions are such a way that we could make elements all the way till the the final peak, the actinide peak of uranium and thorium. So, so this there is a simulation in the next slide, which shows how the neutron, um, the elements are produced in this such an event. 
and uh, we also there are a lot of work progress has may, been made in this uh, area like uh, combination of different uh, ratio of the masses how you can make uh, uh, different um, neutron rich peaks with different abundances so this is a uh, ongoing research which there is a lot of interest both in the nuclear physics side and also um, um, on in the case of atomic physics basically we, we still don't know the opacities for uh, making this kind of a very highly neutron rich ejecta how the um, expected uh, transmission of the what is the if you have a neutron um, spectra from a um, neutron star merger event, how to model them. Still, there is a lot of input data needed, so there is a lot of work going on in this area. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is again, I just wanted to see if you can play it. Let's see. It's working. Yeah, so you can see that uh, how the neutron, um, uh, the reaction happens. It happens at the neutron drip line and slowly radioactively decays to the value of stability. So this is how, and you can also see the, how um, the pattern changes and uh, like, and finally it reaches the solar system or process abundance. So this is another um, uh, thing which we still don't understand. Um, the neutron uh, rich stars show exactly the pattern of solar uh, or process pattern. So how we are able to make um, several generations of uh, supernovae or neutron star merger events are able to make the same amount of these elements. One time, I love one. One more, I know. Go to the train and that person, Mark. There is some background noise, I think. Yeah. Somebody so has a mic on. Can everybody mute, please? Yeah. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah. Yeah. So this is again uh, just to illustrate how a neutron uh, art process that uh, path goes. Like uh, the time scale of rapid neutron capture is like uh, it's microseconds. Like every they every neutron. Um, capture would uh, just the uh, time between two neutron capture event is microseconds, uh, only few microseconds compared to the beta decay. So you would capture many more neutrons before you beta decay to uh, going to the further um, higher elements. But in the case of slow neutron capture, it would take 100 to like more than 1000 years for every neutron capture. So it's a very, there's a large difference between these two. The, so the sites have to be entirely be different. It cannot be in between the two sites. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is how, like, basically, I just wanted to give an introduction just to see how we move from a hydrogen to helium-rich early universe to all the way till the solar system of elements. Uh, yeah, so, and various uh, pathways different uh, masses of the stars bring in these uh, nuclear uh, synthesis products. Next slide. Yeah, so how do we, uh, I just uh, get onto the actual work, like basically like, uh, to, so one way to look at the signatures of the first stars, the, the key questions of stellar archaeology is, uh, how, what do we understand about the first stars in the universe? Can we find them in our own galaxy? And um, if we find them, and can we predict the uh, the nucleosynthesis sites of the early stars, which exploded as supernovae, or when did the neutron star merges start contributing? What are the early uh, IMF, that is the initial mass function of the first uh, stars? Are they top heavy? So these are the big questions which um, the stellar archaeology uh, tries to ad address. So to the way people try to uh, go about in terms of observations, uh, we through large spectroscopic survey. So you can see in the plot on the left, so the spectra, different um, the spectral lines. Like uh, what you see in the top is the solar spectra. It is uh, so Fe by H zero correspond to solar uh, or sun solar spectra, and uh, Fe by H 
uh, like minus three correspond to thousand times uh, metal poor uh, than our sun and uh, so on. So you can see how uh, drastically the spectral features differ with uh, respect to the metallicities. So what uh, the observers look for is uh, what is the most metal poor uh, looking at these strong metallic lines and then take high resolution, further high resolution to study them in detail. And uh, yeah, so the current record holder on metallicity is minus seven. So it's called the Keller star. I don't have a spectra here. So the, so the minus seven metallicity star, we still don't detect any ion lines. What we detect is only calcium line. So calcium H and K are the strongest line in the optical band. So that has been detected for this star, but we don't detect any um, ion lines yet. We need much bigger telescopes to really probe these very faint ion lines to say about the actual metallicities. Yeah, the next slide, please. Yeah, so what is the interesting was, yeah, this is the Keller star I was talking about, the minus 7.5. So, um, so what we know, uh, all these surveys, what uh, su surprising results that came out of these surveys were like, uh, so th though people were looking for more and more metal poor stars and they found all of these metal poor stars have enormous amount of carbon. So the frequency of carbon richness kind of at um, solar metallicity is less than close to 1%. At you go to minus 2.5, it is 25%. And every star below minus five are hundred percent rich in carbon. So we uh, some that just came about very surprising because people didn't expect. We they expect carbon should be also as low as uh, other elements like uh, iron. So so this came as a surprise, and uh, so uh, still it's an open problem. What is the source of these enhanced carbon abundances in the very metal poor stars? Um, so I, I just here basically just try to give a flavor, not going into too much detail. And uh, so, yeah, some of the candidates for uh, enhanced, uh, uh, maybe you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so, so some of the possible uh, candidates to make this carbon enhanced enhancement is the first supernovae to be um, very faint supernovae, basically, what happened is they didn't have enough explosion energy and uh, they, um, they were not able to throw the enhanced rich uh, materials, but only the outer layers have been thrown out. So they are uh, poor in uh, uh, iron, but uh, they are rich in carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. So that is one of the theories. And there are also people proposing rotate, um, heavily rotating massive stars. So they produce during their carbon nitrogen CN cycle and also helium burning the surface wind would have enriched the slow wind would have enriched the gas and then further star formation would have made these uh, carbon rich stars. So we also looked at uh, lithium in these carbon rich stars. So we thought if it is um, this, uh, the ejecta would be uh, because these are processed material and we would expect these stars to have lithium to be less compared to a normal uh, star, which is not carbon rich at the same metallicity. So what we find is carbon is actually very, the carbon enhanced stars and the normal stars at a given metallicity seem to have very similar lithium abundances, which is also kind of surprising. So we, there could be a uh, mm, possibility of two modes of star, star formation happening and uh, depending on the environment, like a uh, denser environment, dust cooling could be a prominent uh, mechanism of cooling the gas and in the uh, uh, dense, lower density region, the carbon, nitrogen and oxygen could uh, cool the gas through fine structure, fine structure cooling. So, so this could be two mechanisms which are happening in the early universe, but uh, yeah, these are something which work which is going on and uh, yeah next slide please yeah so this is uh, something which um, we also try to look at um, like whether what is the carbon enriched stars fraction in our milky way satellite galaxies so milky way satellite galaxies are basically as um, these are remnants of uh, galaxies 
um, while forming Milky Way. So they are uh, kind of um, uh, when the uh, Milky Way forms, it's uh, uh, through hierarchical galaxy formation, small dwarf galaxies would have come together to make the big galaxies. So st still some remnant of these uh, merging galaxies would be visible. So as per the, uh, the models of galaxy formation. So we looked and these uh, dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way are the, called the satellite galaxies. And if uh, primordial star formation had enriched carbon, that should be also visible in, um, um, in these uh, dwarf satellites. So what uh, we also find, the fractions are very similar. So some work, which is, it's not been done for a lot of uh, galaxies because again, they are faint and further. And uh, we find that um, their fractions are not very different from our own halo stars. Next, yeah, next slide, please. And uh, yeah, these are some surveys which we are doing uh, with uh, um, Hanley, uh, the um, Malin Chandra telescope. It's a slitless spectroscopic survey. We wanted to do many stars at the same time. So we use, uh, without using the slit, we use a prism to do this. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, these are some of the outcomes of uh, we are able to find some carbon rich stars. Just I wanted to show the process. Yeah, next one. Uh, and the next question is we also wanted to look at these carbon enrichment uh, in global clusters because we also know that global clusters are also very uh, primordial, very old uh, system in uh, belong to the oldest system in the of uh, any galaxy. So the carbon rich fraction should be very similar for global clusters also. But what we find is there are absolutely no carbon ray enhanced stars detected so far with even large searches. So which is again, very uh, surprising. One thing is also um, noticed is uh, that metallicity ceiling, you know, metal poor stars in the halo all the way till minus seven, however, the metallicity of the global cluster stops at minus 2.5. Currently, we know two global clusters which are below minus 2.5. So those, that is indicated in the figure, like C19 and Phoenix. So these are the two uh, global clusters recently discovered, which are uh, lower than minus three metallicities. So it looks like there could be a metallicity ceiling for forming uh, global clusters. Also, that also implies that there could be a redshift beyond certain redshifts only could global clusters could form, uh, which again could come from the mass of the galaxy because we know the mass and the metallicity correlates for any galaxy. So, so global cluster formation needs a critical mass of the galaxy and hence the metallicity ceiling and uh, maybe these uh, high mass galaxies uh, wouldn't produce uh, the luminosity that is a, uh, the CMP or the carbon rich stars fraction correlates with the luminosity of the galaxy itself. So that's something which uh, has been currently looked at. Next one. Yeah, so also though carbon rich stars are very few in uh, or none, nothing in the global cluster, oh. global cluster stars also show various uh, uh, anomalies that is called this uh, sodium oxygen anomaly. And uh, yeah, next slide. So the, there is a, uh, yeah, again, magnesium aluminum anomaly, which is not seen in the uh, halo stars. This is another open problem. And uh, we still don't know uh, stars that make uh, these anomalies. Uh, nuclear synthesis side, we know that high, high temperature hydrogen burning can make these ones. But such a peculiar stars is not been detected in our own halo. So that is something which is why it is, present only in global cluster, not such an anomaly is seen in the halo stars. That is another open problem in this field. Yeah, next one. Yeah, just to, this is to show like the magnesium isotopes could be a way, way to understand these, um, um, whether it is, what is the source of these anomalies. And this would need, again, bigger telescopes. And uh, yeah, uh, yes, next one. And so here, something which we looked at is basically looking at stars which should have been ejected from in the global clusters, and they could be uh, close to the solar, like our uh, 
uh, nearby, they could eject it and then they could be nearby and we could study them in detail. And these are, again, you can notice that uh, these two stars which we detected, they have very similar abundances, similar to um, sodium and aluminum, similar to global clusters. Yeah. So again, just going back to the problem of uh, the art process enrichment. So this is all about the early stars and carbon fraction. Now, another question which uh, um, uh, stellar archaeology addresses is the um, production of heavy elements. So we, so if uh, the plot on the right hand, uh, left hand side shows if neutron star merges at the source of uh, production of art process elements, then what you see is the the um, the plot. You can see that. It would only contribute to the neutron star merges can contribute only uh, at the metallicity of minus two only they could contribute to this neutron rich ejecta. Whereas we see many more stars which are the red points, much metal poor and still they are rich in neutron capture elements. So how to produce neutron rich material very early on the, in the universe is still an open problem because the time scale of uh, evolution of uh, neutron star mergers, the merger time scales could be very long. And uh, there could be a delay between the alpha. So supernovas make alpha elements. And uh, once they become a, a neutron star merge, neutron star um, remnant, then the neutron star mergers only make um, like neutron rich nuclei beyond iron. So they don't make any of the light elements. So there will be a delay between the supernovae that made alpha elements and then the next uh, the supernova the neutron star mergers that make the neutron rich nuclei. So these are the delay time which has been studied in detail in the chemical evolution, and uh, there is a lot of work going on. But with still an open problem is how to make neutron star mergers merge very early on and contribute to metallicities of minus three, minus four. So still it's an open problem. Though we had a direct evidence of a neutron star mergers producing neutron R process uh, elements. So it's a very clear evidence what you see from this figure on top. There is the detection of strontium and uh, also the light curve also indicated a, um, um, red kilonova, which indicates uh, the material is enriched in actinides and lanthanides. So this is something which is, uh, um, in the in terms of chemical evolution, we, the time scales don't match. We need to, uh, we need some site that would operate very early in the universe, early in the galaxy to make uh, our process. And another evidence is the there are these satellite galaxies, which is called reticulum, which is uh, 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 all the stars, at least the, we, there are seven, eight stars to be detected. All of them are enriched in, uh, in our process. So very the pristine galaxies like uh, dwarf galaxies of Milky Way satellites also show this enhancement in our process. So we need to have a site which operates very early on, which is still uh, open problem in this field. Yeah, next one. Yeah, so the uh, some of the candidates currently are um, collapsars and magneto rotationally driven supernovas and uh, primordial black hole plus neutron stars. So these are the, you know, some of these uh, uh, candidates which have been proposed to that would operate very early in the galaxy. Next one. Yeah, so we did the, a survey called the GOMPA survey using the Hanway Eschel spectrograph. And um, this is the, how we select from the low resolution the metal poor stars, and then we um, observe them at higher resolution. Next slide. Yeah, so these are some of the results I have shown. Like, I think the leftmost, which we haven't um, discussed, is some of the R process rich stars, which are detected from our survey. Next slide. Yeah, so this is another recent work. Um, so what we show is these are the the R process enhancement and compared to the alpha elements, there is a mild trend detected. And the right-hand side plot shows even more a problem because we know thorium would radioactively decay 
And so the metal poor stars should have less thorium compared to uranium. But what we see is completely the opposite trend. So uh, this is also something which needs to be addressed. Yeah, next one. Yeah. Okay, I will just switch gears because uh, so we talked about um, the early evolution and chemical con contribution of um, chemical elements from various sites which and the open problems. And uh, these chemical abundances also play a key role in formation of the planets. And uh, we know there are two competing models right now. Uh, maybe you can enter and see whether other things come up. So one is the core accretion model, which is the forming a core and then further accretion to form bigger planets. And there is another one is the disk fragmentation model, where as a part of the star formation, the planet also forms. And uh, you could go to the next slide. Let's see. Yeah. So the disk instability creates planets and form and the core and then that creates the galaxy. So the time scale of these operation of these two mechanisms are different. So what, uh, it's okay, yeah, you can, you can enter, maybe one more thing would come, yeah, correct. So even when the first few planets were detected, some, the metallicity correlation of these planets were uh, clearly noticed. So all the planets which were discovered at that time, these were all uh, through radial velocity survey and uh, they, um, so these are Jupiter-like planets and all of them showed high metallicity. And uh, then follow-up work by uh, Mayank Narang, uh, they showed like there is clearly uh, the metallicity and the masses of mass of the planets. So in, indicating that core accretion could be one of the key mechanisms. But however, very massive planets and brown dwarfs could fo form in a different uh, mechanisms. And uh, there is uh, Swastik who also worked on alpha abundances to show how um, uh, planet, the mass is connected to the um, uh, planet formation. So they say that heavy elements are quite key and uh, in the formation of uh, uh, giant planets. And uh, so if we consider the chemical evolution, we know that metal rich, in, so there could be a critical metallicity so that uh, at which we could, uh, the giant planet formation could start. So that is something which uh, uh, came about in this um, work. And um, yeah, next one. So we also further explored uh, to see whether carbon plays in any role in the planet formation at all, uh, because carbon uh, also plays a lot in the dust chemistry of the protoplanetary disk. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, so here again, we looked at these are the candidates from the Kepler and uh, Lamo survey. Yeah, next one. Yeah, so basically what we, yeah, this is the methodology. Next one. So this is how we find the carbon abundances for all, like more than 10,000 stars. Yeah, so what we, kind, what we see is that um, carbon rich, uh, so as you go for higher metallicity, the C by Se ratio actually as, as per galaxy chemical evolution, they decrease. So we thought C by Se could be higher for the giant uh, planet hosts, but what we found it's it's not really true. Like uh, carbon is lower compared to iron for giant planet hosts. So this could be just uh, uh, that uh, giant planets hosts are younger. So that could be a critical metallicity which might play a role, but carbon may not really uh, play a key role in the uh, formation of these planets. And the similar studies were also done for oxygen and they found very similar results. Yeah, next one. Yeah, so we also looked at uh, binary systems where basically twins, like the stars which have very similar masses, but uh, one of them, these are visual binaries, well separated and one of them having planet and another one not having planet and wanted to look at a differential abundances so that it gives very high precision in the abundances. So to see whether planet formation actually affects the uh, abundances itself. So, uh, and we there are, these are very few systems. I think about 10 of them could have been uh, studied in the literature and one was studied by us. We find uh, really no correlation between the condensation temperature and these um, abundances. Some elements showed very high, this is candium. 
and we found that that could be due to hyperfine splitting, maybe something uh, related to magnetic field, which is coming in, which we need to further investigate. Yeah. So this is something which is evolving now. Uh, when we go into precision abundances, we need to take into account um, the uh, modeling aspect very clearly. Um, like activity could uh, change the turbulence, convection, and the line formation and magnetic fields. So these things we need to consider more um, uh, as we go for precision abundances. That is what is emerging in this field now. Next one. Yeah, just to show that how these two stars are exactly matching, you can see that their parameters are very similar. So the abundance difference could be very, very uh, key and we can we should be able to find out. But these clear no correlations. So we think that we need to further investigate some of these lines. Like we thought uh, scandium is an odd element and could have uh, would be affected by the hyperfine splitting and the magnetic fields. So uh, which is causing the difference in the abundances, which we are looking at it a little more closely. So then we also try to look at uh, some exoplanet atmospheres uh, with, again, our own telescope. It's not something which is which has been routinely done by various other facilities, but we thought with the uh, Indian facility, we wanted to do uh, exoplanet transit spectroscopy. So yeah, this is uh, a figure you would know, like basically the transit depth at different um, um, wavelengths are measured. So these are relative, the transit depths would give the relative area between the star, what is the area blocked by the planet at a given wavelength. Yeah, next slide. Next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So here again, we looked at uh, using our uh, HCP, we observed a couple of uh, a good system where we have a reference star so that we can track the any variation in the atmosphere or instrumentation or the atmospheric dispersion. All these uh, effects have to be cancelled. So we had to choose a proper reference star. So we observed this thing for, as part of uh, Adira's thesis. Next one. Yeah, next. Yeah, so these are the two, three systems. Yeah, you can click once more. Maybe. Yeah, so these are the three systems. So we have these two stars, star and a reference, and we do the relative, um, use the, um, we do a relative photometry for different band passes and then construct a light curve. Next slide. Yeah, so this is how the light curve is, uh, white light curve is created by summing the entire band pass. And then any residual is attributed to systematics. And then we use, Correct that for individual wavelengths. Can you go to the next uh, click on that? So this is called the common mode correction. And then we are able to get a nice light curve. And this is same correction is applied across the wavelengths. Yeah, next one. Yeah, so this is the um, light curve for various wavelengths. And you can see how it is. The residuals are very less. Next slide. Yeah, so this is again a final transmission spectra. It's really not, quite flat. We couldn't really, but what you can notice is the uh, the blue points are from Hanley, but green is HST and uh, Gemini. So Gemini is an eight meter telescope, and um, you can see the quality is very similar, uh, except for uh, HST does a very good job compared to other ones. Yeah, next one. Yeah, this in this case was 127. We are able to see clear the Raleigh slope. Next one. Yeah, so we also tried doing some uh, transit spectroscopy at high resolution using Keck telescope. Next one. Yeah, so this is basically what we are looking at is uh, as the planet crosses the um, star, um, you would see with respect to the star, the planet will be moving at a velocity. So can you go to the next slide? Uh, okay, so these are some tricks which we used for doing accurate wavelength calibration basically. Uh, yeah, next one. Next one. Yeah, so basically there are some residual distortions in the wavelength calibration which we further corrected. So that was important, crucial for detecting the signal that is the planet is 
when it is transiting with respect to the star, it is moving at a velocity. To retrieve that velocity signal, this recalibration was uh, essential. Next. Yeah, so this is the final spectra, what we are getting. The, um, so this is the final uh, uh, detection of um, sodium from WASP-49A. So which has been done with the Keck telescope for the first time because the Keck telescope, uh, the high resolution spectrograph, it's not closed enclosed in a vacuum chamber. It's not a stable spectrograph. So this wavelength recalibration was something important to um, achieve this. Yeah. So we also tried with this with um, for very bright stars with our own uh, handley Asher spectrograph, and here we see some signal for a very well known object. But uh, yeah. The next one yeah so we here we are still able to detect but there is a blue shift so the red point um, is the expected velocity signal but we are getting a, a blue shifted uh, absorption so that indicates either there is matter coming from uh, rushing from the day side to the night side so that is why we are seeing a blue shifted uh, absorption next one yeah, so we also, this is another aspect we are looking at basically like uh, how uh, the disk inhomogeneity also affects the transit signal. And these are some preliminary work. We have just looked at various indices, whether they correlate with this, um, <clears throat> with, um, um, with inhomogeneity in the stellar disk. So this is done using uh, the heart spectra. Basically, the um, sun is observed like a star. And then we looked at um, various line indices and correlated the star spots. And uh, next, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so this is, we just looked at uh, how the faculae fraction correlates with various uh, line indices. So this work is done with, uh, uh, like in collaboration with Raj Guru, so who provided us the data on the sun and we looked at the uh, line indices. So this is something which is an important field, emerging field people are looking at uh, how the stellar inhomogeneity on the disk, like uh, faculty spots and other um, uh, features would affect the transit signal as well as the radial velocity signal. So, next one. Yeah, so this is uh, just, I just want to move to a little bit uh, from the science to the instrumentation. So actually, uh, so when I joined, I, um, a year or so, I was part of this Hanley Asian spectrograph. The PI is uh, Sunitra, Sunitra Giridhar, and this is the team. So I was, mm, I didn't have much experience uh, doing instrumentation, but uh, so that was the first time I started to work. And uh, one of, I had a grad student, PhD student uh, on instrumentation. So I had to learn a lot on uh, that was an opportunity for me to learn. So, so this is the team, which is uh, shown the, so this is done in, with collaboration uh, with the New Zealand. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's um, Kiwi Star Optics from New Zealand made the spectrograph and we did the, all the control um, electronics and uh, commissioning and installing everything is being done uh, yeah by i so that's how this this is like uh, some of these photographs to showing the how the optical um, like table had to be lifted to the telescope floor and then brought it down to the inside the enclosure yeah next one yeah this is now at, it's on the telescope on the top of the dome and then now we are bring, going to bring it down to the, uh, yeah, uh, to the enclosure. Next one. Yeah, so this is now some of the components aligned. You can see the big prisms. The prisms are so big. And uh, yeah, next one. Yeah, always, again, this is, <laughs> we are all discussing in how to check some of the alignments. Next one. And yeah, this is the after commissioning, we are having some snacks and uh, the, yeah, so this, you can see Sunitra here and the team. Yes. Next one. Yeah, so I just want to move from so that from the early experience from uh, Hanley Ashil spectrograph, uh, where uh, we worked a lot on the instrumentation model. So, how to uh, use the design to calibrate the data for achieving. Uh, accurate calibration as well as uh, achieving uh, stability 
So that work kind of uh, helped in moving on to my contribution to other facilities as well. So this is the upcoming, um, at least ELT is already on the way of construction, but TMT and GMT is, uh, yeah, there is delays in that. Yeah, okay, let me go to that. So one thing which uh, uh, sensitivity of the telescope as you go for bigger and bigger aperture, it's, uh, we know that it uh, goes with aperture area, but in the case of background, background limited, as you go very fainter and fainter object, we are, reaching the close to the background limit of the uh, uh, sky. So then the sensitivity with the diffraction limited telescopes goes by D power four. That is something very important. So adaptive optics becomes very important for bigger telescope compared to smaller one because to reach the sensitivity of D power four. And uh, yeah, next one. Yeah, Shibrani, sorry to interrupt, but you had asked me to give me a reminder after 40 minutes. So it's okay. been 50, 50 minutes, okay? Okay, I'll yeah, quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Next one. Next one, yeah. Yeah, so this is just a comparison of how um, like uh, HST and uh, uh, TMT would do for M31. You can see that the stars much, much very well resolved. And also galactic center, which is shown on the lower left, like Keck versus TMT. You can the resolution improvement gain is can be seen. And another area which TMT would play a role is the uh, direct imaging of exoplanets. So currently, all the we could uh, only about five to six systems we can actually directly image. They correspond to like uh, hundreds beyond like 10 to 100 AUs from the host stars and they are self-luminous. So very bright, hot uh, planets only we can do with the current eight meter telescopes. But as you go to TMT, we should be able to actually, Jupiter equivalents should be able to image and also planets can be imaged with the, uh, in their reflective light, reflected light in term, instead of uh, the self-luminous infrared light. So these are the key areas which TMT would be looking at. Yeah, next slide. So I just wanted to show some things which um, I'm it is, here. I'm not directly involved, but I just as an introduction wanted to show like a TMT would have uh, the 30 meter telescope would uh, comprise of 492 segments, hexagonal segments. And in India, we are making these um, almost close to 100 segments in India and along with the support system. So which is a very key thing because uh, the support system should uh, compensate for any small error in the figuring of the um, mirror. So the figure, the support error, the figure error should be less than 11 nanometers or so. And uh, But the support system also should have a large stroke. So to get a big stroke and still achieve a nanometer accuracy error, uh, signal is what is uh, very challenging in the, in the segment support assembly. Next one. Yeah, so this is where I also started contributing. Basically, when uh, TMT, with the experience with handicial spectrograph, then we, there was a mini study conducted by the TMT partners to contrib contribute to various um, instrumentation. And uh, so there were um, several a mini study has been uh, kind of um, decided based on the requirements. Uh, combining various teams across the partnership. So I was part of uh, this mini study, which did the um, detailed analysis of the optical design and uh, designed the flexure compensation. So what you can see is as we go for bigger and bigger telescopes, the um, instrument size scales with the telescope aperture, like uh, you can see this equation, like uh, the seeing disc becomes bigger and bigger uh, because of the plate scale. So the instrument size, if you are operating and with using seeing limited, not diffraction limited, the instrument size becomes big, the gratings become huge, the beam size is also bigger. So you can see how a 2.5 meters SDSS spectrograph is, you can see like a, it's like two, two feet height, but whereas the DMOS on tech, the Keck 10 meters, you can see it is at least a, like a two people height of two tall people and uh, whereas uh, if you have a tft size we would have two-story building sized instruments and what you 
this challenging thing is also that in an ultrazimuth spectrogram uh, telescope, the instrument need to compensate for the field rotation. So the instrument has to rotate as the exposure goes on. So that adds to gravity dependent uh, flexure. Uh, so can you go to the next slide? So this is where we kind of, uh, I have put the um, people who really, main people who contributed to this. Though I was leading the work package, the main contributors are from Sriram and Devika in, during this phase. So the design comes from uh, Rebecca, who is the, but we did the analysis of the performance, how a uh, uh, um, compensation mechanism for flexure could be achieved. So what we notice is the, there's a, the, the um, grating is operated at a very large outer pl plane angle to get the pupil relief. So which was uh, good for achieving a very compact design, but it had a severe distortion. You can see the, uh, the spectral format is fully not fitting into the detector. And uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, what you can also notice is that when there is uh, some, any flexure happens, the, by moving just the detectors alone, you can't compensate for flexure. And what is shown in the left hand side, uh, right hand side is the uh, residual distortion. It is like uh, the small square shows one pixel. So you can notice up to like close to five pixels distortion, residual distortions would still remain in the, um, so which came out to be a surprise. So so this is the work, work which we did, like doing an end-to-end -end, uh, analysis to see how the sensitivity and uh, the residual distortion will come in the design. Next one. So once we, this has also been checked with the Keck telescope, we are same strategy has been applied to Keck uh, DMOS instrument and we compared and we were able to get a very good match that our procedures are working well. Next one. Next. Yeah, so once uh, based on this, the previous design has been kind of uh, re-looked at and people looked at the fiber-based design. So we also looked at the fiber allocation and made a tool. Arun Surya contributed to this, how to make a, and also we made the flexure compensation tool and uh, this um, to, so this is something which, uh, some of the important contribution which we made to this phase. The next one. So finally, this is the current design because of all these uh, different, uh, so it went through at least three, four design choices and uh, we we were main part of these analysis and uh, uh, giving the simulations and uh, designing some of these strategy for the fiber positioners and allocation efficiency and all that. So finally, this is the current design and uh, Ramya is the lead currently on this uh, current uh, phase of this project. And you can see this is a kind of two-story building size. Uh, I'm not going into details, but if anybody wants, I think I would be happy to. So these are the contributors from the ITCC. Uh, we have a mechanical, yeah. I think you can move to the next one. So then, uh, yeah, the previous one. Yeah, so this is after the success in the WFAS and there was also a call for white papers for the next generation instruments. So we competed with other partners and put in a white, white paper and uh, our proposal was very favorably reviewed and India is currently leading the high resolution optical spectrograph for uh, TNT. So the previous WFAS, uh, the wide field optical spectrograph, the low resolution is led by Caltech and India is playing a major supporting role on various subsystems. And in the case of high resolution optical spectrograph, India would be taking a lead yeah, next one. And uh, actually, I'm the PI of this. Uh, play, uh, the, basically, I led the white paper. And uh, yeah. So we currently, we are looking at how the feeding is uh, options are for uh, how to feed the instrument uh, from the telescope to the instrument and various uh, in interference with the existing spectrograph in the NASMED platform. Yeah, next one. Yeah, so this is another. Um, precursor to the um, uh, TMT planetary system imager. So this is on the Keck and IA is contributing to that. This is also a, um, a collaboration which came about as part of this TMT and Ravi Banyal is leading this uh, effort. And so this is um, 
directly imaging um, this scales is a pro uh, it can directly image and take a spectra of um, exoplanets and uh, this is the design you can see next uh, slide maybe you can yeah so this is simulation how if you take a spectra uh, how you will be if you can clearly actually remove the spectral area mm -hmm. so accurately because this is the movie what is shown is a snapshot of different wavelengths how the speckle will kind of move out with the different wavelength is increasing but whereas the planet signal will remain the same because it would have a different wavelength signal compared to speckle yeah. next one yeah so this is uh, some of the science cases how to uh, with the uh, scales like it because this is the first uh, instrument that is going all the way till five microns. So very many cool planets could be directly imaged with this uh, instrument. So this is expected to be commissioned the next uh, like 25, sometimes 25 March or something like that. So it was originally planned 24 this year, end, end of this year. So we are already into final design is over. We are into fabrication and I is making some of these uh, cold stop rotators and imaging channel is completely designed and uh, uh, designed and uh, development everything is done at i and the calibration system is also designed at i yeah next one so this uh, through this project we will also have access to the keck telescope and uh, so this is another thing uh, io on the simulation showing a different wavelengths would be able to clearly say that uh, how the volcanoes evolve at different time scales. Uh, yeah, next one. Yeah, so this is, I think I'm close to the final slides, basically. So the upcoming era is very uh, um, exciting for uh, um, um, stellar archaeology. There are different part parts of the puzzles can be filled with various uh, information like astrometry from Gaia and uh, like uh, seismology, like missions from Kepler, similar to that. So that could also probe the interiors of the stars and the kinematics of the stars along with the chemical composition would give uh, different puzzles to be fitted and work on, uh, make progress, you know. Uh, so this uh, upcoming decade will be really, really exciting for uh, this field of stellar archaeology. And the uh, next one. <clears throat> so these are the collaborators and my students. Um, I hope I have included everybody in this room. So yeah, so I just wanted to make some just a few, uh, one one minute remark on like my reflection on what uh, I felt about moving around in various uh, different aspects field of astronomy, both in um, like, so after my postdoc, I moved into instrumentation. Uh, again, it is probably as part of job requirement. So, but uh, uh, though, though it kind of um, probably reduced my productivity in other area, but uh, it was uh, exciting for me to know, learn new field, new fields. But I later realized it's all coming together. So I was able to uh, do my observations much more uh, like uh, efficiently, like uh, plan more strategy to do uh, better observing strategy for uh, doing science. So the experience in instrumentation really helped. Um, yeah, so there are advantages. There are some disadvantages, but I think uh, I making a balance was kind of sometimes tricky, so but uh, I found it's overall very enriching experience. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Shidrani. That was a very exciting and inspiring talk. I definitely got motivated. So the thank floor you. is open. To, so. Yeah. so the floor is open to questions now. Uh, you can directly unmute yourself and ask a question or raise a hand. We can go, you know one by one in sequence. Or you can also type in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Shivrani, I had a one question. Yeah, sure. You know, you talked about the blue ship uh, 
in the observation for exoplanet, mm -hmm. could it be the rotation of the planet itself with atmosphere? If, because if it was rotating, then yeah. you would have that kind of a effect on the lines. Yeah, yeah. So that could be one possibility. But these are very, uh, you are perfectly correct. That could be a possibility. But for this particular system, like it's quite, uh, it's a very close by planet and tidally locked. So it, with respect to the star, it's not rotating. So, so that is why we think it's some material rushing from the day side to night side. But what you said is uh, quite, uh, yeah, it is a possibility for another other planets. This could be any blue ship. We have to look at the rotation with respect to the star with the relative rotation. So here, this particular planet is kind of tidally locked because it's very close. It's very close to the host star at a close less than a one AU. So and uh, and it's a Jupiter-like planet and it's tidally locked. So so that's why we don't see the the blue shift. This this is Jayant here. Uh, Shivrani, what do you what do you think uh, is needed to build a really strong experimental group, both at at, at institutes and at universities? Yeah, so one thing like uh, making astronomers build instruments, like it takes a lot. So we don't somebody we, there should be also uh, efforts to do research in technology. So which is uh, we have to. So, so we need as astronomers. You have to kind of, if you are moving to instrumentation, uh, a lot of time you have to spend on reading new technologies and uh, at least even to connect with other people. Uh, whereas, because most engineers would work on the skill set and they would be working on that, but actual development in that area is uh, mostly it comes from astronomers. That's my experience. Yeah. So connecting to universities, IITs, who would actually do research in technology may be an important aspect, I think. Chanda has a question. Chanda, please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Shurani, very interesting to hear about your different work. Uh, yeah, I had one question about, uh, you mentioned that you don't see these metal core stars in globular clusters, and that was a surprise. So can you please explain that? Because uh, globular clusters, uh, you know, you said they have to form in massive galaxies, but massive galaxies also form as a merger of smaller galaxies, right? So how do you explain you don't see these stars? In... Yeah, perfect. That's really true, Chanda. Like if we, yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, as you said, yeah, even a massive galaxy, like if global, so I, I'm not sure, like, uh, do we, uh, very low luminous, what is the luminosity cutoff uh, we know of, uh, a galaxy that would have um, global clusters. Do we do you know that, Chanda? Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I yeah. No, uh, I don't actually know as a function of. Yeah, I think it's there is uh, not much observations known about that, like uh, for global clusters in a very low low luminous galaxies. Because fact, I'm galaxy. not even sorry. I'm not even sure whether the masses of globular clusters as a function of galaxy mass have been studied. You know, that goes along the same direction. Yeah, hmm. yeah the numbers go with galaxy mass. Huh, like that I of, know. Yeah, yeah. But the mass of the globular cluster, whether that depends on the galaxy mass, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is what uh, it was surprising people looked for, uh, why there are no uh, carbon-rich stars, mm -hmm. metal poor stars in globular clusters. And uh, yeah. So again, yeah, this is yeah my way of looking at it, whether luminous, there could be a connection. But as you said, it's very true. Like if we have to form a more luminous galaxy, it has to come from a small galaxy. Mm -hmm. galaxy then yeah. it should still host a carbon-rich uh -huh. star. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, you have done an enormous amount of different kinds of work. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Chandra. There is a question in the chat box by Indu Lekha. I'll read it. Please mention your experience with industry, if any, too. 
Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks, <laughs> Indilika. Like, actually, uh, we, at least during the early phase, we didn't really work with industry. Mostly, we did all the work in-house. Uh, so, later, our recent experience, again, not exactly with the industry, but uh, with the triple IT, we started developing some, uh, uh, like, the software, the instrument control software which is which has to inter interface with the observatory software so that is something which is completely out for like astronomers <laughs> no clue on that and triple uh, it they are experts and they also find this as a very uh, they find uh, these different systems very heterogeneous systems um, uh, interacting with each other there are a lot of concurrencies which is happening so they thought this would be a very important thing even for their academics to teach give an example they thought this is an excellent uh, um, uh, like um, like up at, uh, like excellent thing for them even for teaching their students as well as contributing so we thought uh, that was one thing which they they wanted to simulate all these um, but whereas a vendor, uh, for example, would just do the exactly what is asked to do, but uh, uh, a triple IT who was kind of academic plus a vendor joint uh, kind of a uh, institute. So they were uh, interested in both delivering the products, at, uh, but also they were interested in the architecture and the research on that aspects, the academic, the software architect architecture and the you know, how it would sustain for a like uh, 50 years, what is the, uh, how do we do, what is the software we should, and how to simulate that. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert, yeah, but that was a diff, something which, uh, uh, that is one, only one experience I had. But uh, yeah, in terms of the HESP, I had some experience with the industry, but again, it's very minimal. Mostly the New Zealand team did, the interaction with the vendors we were um, it's mostly uh, my experiences with purchasing and uh, uh, but uh, with new zealand team if we consider them as a vendor the, their experience in astronomy was very limited so pre shipment the testing deciding on the 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 compiling the matrix for what you have to compile to like um, the compliant matrix so the scientific uh, what you matters of performance that has to be decided by us so uh, yeah, so that was a little bit challenging when they didn't have an astronomy background and we had to work with them i see no more the hands raised or any questions in the chat box so so last chance do we have any more questions for shivrani No. Yeah. But Thank you. <laughs> I think uh, if there are questions, I think we can always get back to you. I hope. Yeah. Or sure, email yes. or your in yes, person. Yes. Of course. Yes. Okay. Indulatha has thanked you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Shivrani, that was a great talk. Thanks again. And yeah, thank you. It's uh, thanks for this opportunity. I think I was really overwhelmed. So, like, so feel very like uh, excited to see same, so many of the colleagues whom I know join this. Yeah. Thanks again. So thank we'll you. close the session now. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.